Hi, I'm Ann Steckel at California State University, Chico, and I'm with the Technology and Learning Program here on campus. Today I have with me Professor Asa Mittman of the um, Art Department, specifically Art History, and he's here today to talk about a podcast project that he did with his students in a course called Art 100, which we redesigned uh, in 2009. So Asa, will you tell us a little bit about your podcast project? Sure, thanks. First, I'm going to describe briefly the class this was for so that uh, it'll fit into a bit of a context. This was a new online version of Art 100. Art 100 is the art class, the art history class, art appreciation, art interpretation for people from the other side of campus. It's the one art class that an engineer might take, that a biologist might take, uh, an economist might take. And so its goals are very specific as I see it, and very different from the rest of my courses, the courses that are designed for my majors. When I'm doing classes at the lower division for art majors, humanities majors, my goal is to establish the fundamental database on which they can build as they move higher and higher in the field. These students who are taking 100, by and large, are not going to move higher in the field. Those that do will then generally take 101, 102, and then go into the upper divisions. This is essentially a one-shot deal. This is a class that will be the sum total of the art background that these students are going to get before they graduate from college. So rather than hammer them with names and dates and places, lots of rote memorization, instead I work on developing skills because, to be honest, they're going to forget that Imhotep was the royal builder of the first of the pyramids, the earliest named architect that we have. They won't remember that he designed King Djoser's Step Pyramid. What they will, I hope, retain are skills that they can take with them. So my 100 class has uh, a few basic goals. The first, and this is by far the most important, is to make them love art. That may sound ridiculous, but that is actually my goal. I want them in the rest of their life when they travel to think, I should go to that museum. I should see what's there. People go to New York and don't go into the Metropolitan. People go to Paris and don't go into the Louvre. This kills me. So the first thing I want them to do is just catch the bug of it. I want them to love it. I want them to go back. The second is I want them to feel comfortable once they go in. A lot of folks these days find art very alienating. They go into a museum, don't know what the hell to do. How long are you supposed to spend looking at a painting? What angle are you supposed to use when you're looking at a sculpture? People don't know. It's a very alienating atmosphere, the uh, modern museum, for a lot of people. And so I want to give them the tools which will allow them to confront art, to deal with it, to break it down, to get its basic fundamentals. This is more important for this class to me than that they remember the name, date, and place of every object in the corpus of world art history. So what I did was I designed a class which is designed to focus aspects. And if I could get my class now. Yeah. I'm very glad you had her do that instead of trying to tell me how to. Okay. So this is, now they're seeing my screen, correct? Yes, Great. This is the homepage for my course, which is uh, Arts 100, Art Appreciation, Multicultural Perspectives. And the basic layout of the course is that they have a series of online recorded lectures that cover first basic technical details like how to interpret line and shape and color, symmetry, balance, composition, uh, and also in architecture, some basic structural things. Why does a post and lintel stand up? Why does an arch stand up? What is a dome? These kind of things. Uh, and then uh, uh, some basics on how to interpret art. How do we draw meaning out of any kind of art? And then it goes into themes, so major themes that you can find. If you walk into any museum in the world, you will find themes like reproduction and sexuality, gods, mortality and immortality, power, the human body. These are universals in art. They are all over every kind of art. So 
when a student walks into a museum, they should be able to say, that is a, a portrait of a very important person. That has to be a king or a ruler of some kind. I know it because it has this, that, and the other thing. And so it's not so much about saying, oh, that looks like early Baroque art to me, but rather about saying, I know what to do with that piece. I know how I'm supposed to feel in front of that piece. Um, and so the students listen to those lectures, and then I go to the course calendar. This course last ran in January. What they do is listen to lectures on, say, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. They take the quizzes related to those on Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and then they have uh, essays due on the following Mondays for each of the weeks of the course. The quizzes are all multiple choice. They're designed to be low stakes, numerous, in essence, fairly easy. The idea is, did you get the most basic rudiments of this material? And hopefully they did, and most of them do. Uh, and then the essays, these are really what art history consists of. Art history is not multiple choice uh, in, in its format. It's designed around making careful arguments about works of art. And so the essays ask students to do a visual analysis for the first one of a single monument of art. And then the second one asks, this has been the standard in art history since Heinrich Wolflin in 1912, to compare and contrast where you take two different works of art and say, how each one highlights the features of the others. Okay, the final assignment is the California Art Podcast, and that's what I'm gonna talk about for the rest of uh, this session. All of this is fine and good, but all of this so far consists of students viewing recorded lectures with attendant um, uh, PowerPoint, essentially recorded PowerPoint that have the images, and these are all going to appear on their screen in a small window. They're going to be seeing the Parthenon, and it's going to be two inches wide. Uh, they're going to see the Hercules, you know, the Farnese of Hercules, this 17 foot tall monumental mass of stonework. And he's going to be an inch and a half high. They don't convey that well in this format. And so I needed there to be at least one assignment where these students have to go and see a real live work of art, an actual piece. Uh, and so this assignment is designed to get them away from the computer screen and out into the world. So the idea is, in essence, the students all have to go out in the world, find a work of art, preferably one that other people have access to. So not something you know in your grandma's living room, but some, a public work of art uh, in a town, in a, uh, on a campus, or even in a public museum. Look at it, take a photograph of it, and write and record a very brief podcast describing uh, the student's response to it um, and why they think it looks the way it does. How is it functioning? Anne. Is there, could you tell anybody who's tuned in today what a podcast is in case they don't know? Oh, yeah, sure, you bet. Uh, a podcast, well, you could more succinctly than I could, but a podcast is simply a very easy way of recording um, a bit of audio that can then be downloaded um, later on. Uh, I podcast NPR obsessively. Um, the only way I have any idea what's happening outside of my classrooms. Uh, did that suffice? Okay. Uh, any other questions at this juncture? Okay. So uh, they take a photograph, they find a work, photograph it, write and record a brief podcast discussing the work of art, uh, and then they can record this through a tool that we have um, integrated into our Vista Learning Management System, which is this Wimba Podcaster, uh, which is pretty simple. Basically, they hit record, they record, they hit stop. Uh, there's a box underneath where they can then paste in a transcript so that the um, recordings are all accessible for um, the hearing impaired. Uh, and then they click upload, and it's automatically uploaded into the system. Uh, There's an online question. Yeah. She's wondering if the class is hybrid, blended, or online. The class is fully online. This class doesn't have an in-person uh, element to it. Now, all of that was fine, and that's sort of where this all began. I thought this would be great. The students will be able to sort of emulate what I've been presenting as 
a way of conducting art history. I've been essentially doing podcasts all semester for them. They can listen to me talking about works of art. Now they can themselves perform that activity. So it's using the skills that I have been explicitly and implicitly trying to develop in them, uh, both through the course material and through the manner in which I deliver it. Uh, but one of the things that I've thought a lot about in, in teaching over the years is that most of our assignments are to some degree a dead end, by which I mean that students do work, their professor reads it, and then it's thrown away. That's the end of it. It doesn't have a life beyond the grade that it's assigned. And so I think this doesn't lead to really a, a great deal of investment uh, on the part of some students because they know it's not going anywhere. So I've been trying to think of ways in which classwork can extend beyond the classroom environment. And so that's uh, where, uh, in conversations with Ann Steckel, um, we came up with the idea of making these publicly accessible. And so what we used was a very easy to use uh, what website development site, site that lets you build websites more or less instantly um, uh, called NetVibes. And what it lets you do is put in these little plugins, these little windows, uh, however many you want and with fairly varied content. And so the first thing we uh, – did was we put in a, uh, an RSS feed, which takes the podcast that the students have recorded directly out of the Vista page and puts them up onto this publicly available site. The Vista site is closed. Only people enrolled in the class have access to it. This, anyone in the world has access to. So that lets their, uh, their audio be available, but the audio pertaining to a particular work of art is not very helpful without the work of art. Uh, and so the next thing we did was add a Google Maps uh, insert, which allows the students to tag the specific location where they saw the work of art and upload a photograph that they took of it. Um, and so uh, if we click through, for example, we can see Statue of a Stone Woman by Shannon Darcy. Uh, and then if we take a look we can see, not surprisingly, a number of our little pins are located in Chico because that's where a lot of the students are from. Uh, but we can zoom in and in and in, and you can see that over the course of uh, the two runs that I've had of this class, a great deal of the public art in and around Chico is starting to be photographed and podcasted. Um, so what this site allows anyone to do is log on, look through the works of art either by listening to the podcast first or by looking uh, through the uh, photographs of them, and you can find them just by clicking from pin to pin. Uh, these are the three Native American women. They're actually just behind my building on campus. And then also uh, then they can listen to the audio, which you do simply by clicking play. Let's see if we can... I don't know if there's audio going on this. According to this, it's playing, but perhaps the audio is not turned on in the, this machine. Um, I don't know. Probably not. Okay. Well, trust me when I say that the audio is now playing and would be on your home computer. Uh, and by all means, please go check this out. It's at www.netvibes.com slash CSU Chico Art Podcast. Uh, and so you can tour through it and see it yourself. Um, sure. Uh, if you click on any of these, what you should get, here you go, is um, the, the feed itself, and you'll see the title, and in this case, the transcript uh, provided by the student, and then you could also uh, play it directly from here again, but uh, because the audio isn't currently turned on, you won't hear anything. You can see the bars are going. <laughs> Uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, that allows anyone uh, access to this. This was something we worked on in the class as a whole to provide uh, access for as many people as we ca could, and one of the main ways we did that was by including um, transcriptions of all of the lectures and these uh, transcriptions of all of the students' podcasts as well. Uh, so the result of this, at least I hope, the result of this is a greater degree of investment on the part of the students who are 
uh, who know that they're doing something which will go beyond just the classroom. And the assignment captures it in exactly these terms. They are going to be representatives of our campus. They're going to be uh, uh, providing a resource which is labeled with the CSU Chico name, and we want them to represent well. And I've been really impressed. I think that the students have done a wonderful job uh, in making these. The other result, lo and behold, is something that seems like an actually useful entity. Um, I was pleasantly, absolutely flabbergasted and shocked uh, after the first run of the class when I saw that the Google map had had almost 3,000 views. Now, this class had about 50 students in it. They could each one have only clicked through so many times. So clearly this represented a lot of people who were not students. So then I ran the class again, another about 50 students, and now we have almost 5,000 views. We don't know who these people are. We don't know who's viewing it, but we do know that somebody out there is clicking and somebody is using it. So my hope is that over time as I run this semester after semester, what this site will become is essentially a digital archive um, describing a great wealth of the public art available uh, in primarily the North State, but California. And even if we were to zoom out and out, we would see uh, other locations throughout the world. See how far out we can get. So you can see, uh, yeah, we had one student logging in from Hawaii, uh, Arkansas in the middle there. I think I had a student also. Didn't we have one? I think not. I thought there was one also from, uh, from the Middle East who had logged in. But uh, you can see we're slowly spreading. We're slowly colonizing uh, the continent. So uh, that's what I wanted to say. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to have them. Okay. I'm I'm going to ask you a question, Lisa, and that's going to be um, any feedback, good or bad, could you relate to us that has come from your students and maybe any um, maybe above average reaction that you may have had to this project with the podcast? Sure, you bet. I had um, uh, uh, two kinds of feedback primarily. Uh, on the negative side, the less technically savvy students did have some trouble with it. Now. I recorded a click-by-click -click guide um, whereby the students could hear me and watch my mouse moving across the screen saying, click here, this is the upload button, click the upload button, and so on, straight through the whole assignment. And I had a number of students who said, thank God for that. I didn't see it at first. Once I found it, it made all the difference. It made what would have otherwise been impossible for me fairly straightforward. There were a couple of students, though, who did not, uh, uh, who just continued to have uh, problems with it. It does require the integration of a number of web resources. Now, I would have thought that students enrolling in an online class would be reasonably web savvy. This is a notion I have been disabused of. Uh, but I did also get a lot of very positive feedback students who wrote saying they really enjoyed doing it, they enjoyed looking for works of art, they enjoyed uh, writing about them and, and, and having the opportunity to speak about them. So, um, so I, I have had each time that I ran it, one or two students who had uh, extensive technical difficulties, um, but that's balanced against, say, a dozen each run who really got a lot out of it, who really noted that they enjoyed it. Uh, yeah, how do you make sure that the next group of students aren't duplicating um, a review of a, a particular piece of art that somebody else already done? Uh, that's a perfectly good question. My answer is that I'm not going to because there's well more than two minutes to be said on any given work of art. Um, by the same token, you know, we could go through, go to the library and go to the section on Michelangelo and how many books could we find dedicated, just books solely dedicated to the Sistine Chapel. So if we can have multiple discussions of any work of art within the academy, we can have multiple discussions of any work of art by these students. And I do have, uh, uh, for example, the, the hands in Chico have attracted several uh, podcasts. Uh, some of the works of art that are right on campus have also attracted several. This is fine. I see no problem with it whatsoever. Uh, in a way, what it does is it turns a monologue into a conversation. 
So I'm happy to have more people discussing it. Um, just as a, a little aside, the one thing that I really appreciated in checking your podcast is the fact that it does extend outside the classroom to the average person. So some of the works of art that are on campus that we walk by every single day, and you just kind of see them and you keep on walking, I can actually find out who created the work of art, when it was created, maybe some inspiration that allowed the art piece to be um, placed here on campus. And it makes me feel a little bit more connected to what I see uh, each day. So I appreciated that. Oh, well, that's wonderful. Um, a lot of public art is what's been referred to as invisible art. It's there, but we pay no attention to it. We go to a museum, we go, oh, there's a thing on the spotlight, and we pay attention to it. The same exact work of art, when it's put on campus, uh, you know, when I was in grad school, uh, there was a copy of Rodin's The Thinker directly in front of the library. Now, this is a work of art that, in a museum context, attracts thousands of viewers who will stop and stare and contemplate, and people will be sketching it and photographing it and taking their picture with it. In front of the library, nobody even stopped. There would be people eating their lunch underneath it, sitting on the pedestal, but nobody paid it any attention. Public art has this problematic nature of disappearing, and so anything that draws our attention back to it, I think, is a plus. There's one other thing, though, that, uh, that made me think about, about taking this outside of the classroom and, and to a more public audience. Um, there's a very palpable, I don't want this to be too political, but there's a very palpable battle going on right now about the funding of higher education and uh, very often about the role of the humanities within that. And uh, one of the things that we have on the whole done very, very poorly is articulate to the public why what we do matters, why it's important, why it's significant, why anybody should care. Uh, most of us write books that will have a, a, a small specialized audience um, that uh, 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 have low print, print runs and are not intended to be readable by a general readership. That's not their function. We then will teach to, uh, yeah, at Chico, I might have as many as three or 400 students in a given year. That's not a large body of, of people. And so anything that we can do that will make the rest of the population more aware of what it is that we're doing in here, that there is a reason for us to be doing that. What we do is valuable and important and interesting. Uh, I, think, I think more and more we should be challenging ourselves to make those efforts, to do more outreach, to try and contact the public, the community, so that they will see the value in what we do. Um, I have a question, Asa. When you started, you mentioned that one of your goals for this class was to try to get people who aren't majors to love art. Mm -hmm. This kind of activity that you created um, in a fully online class, to me, seems very um, engaging, immersive. And I wonder if you have been able to tell that you've achieved that goal more since you added this activity than you have. <sighs> Well, the, um, I used to teach a version of this course uh, at Arizona State that was, I did an, uh, an online 100, and it was much less interactive in a few ways. First, it didn't have this podcast. Second, uh, in the online lectures, there are these pop-up quizzes that will come up in the middle, and I may describe a work of art for a few minutes, and then a window will pop up and say, describe the visual qualities of this work, or now compare this work to this other one, something like that. And that was designed, I didn't even grade those, that was designed the same way I might use it in, in, in an in-class class. I might just say, can you please compare and contrast these works for us uh, uh, in a way, uh, the, the goal is simply to keep students engaged. Um, I have had more and more positive uh, unsolicited feedback from the students here about uh, this assignment and this course than I had uh, at Arizona State, where the course was much larger. I might have 200 or 300 students enrolled there, and I might hear from two of them, whereas here I've had 50, and I might hear from a dozen or 20 of them. Um, so I view that as a very, uh, very promising sign. Um, one of the real problems with online classes is they can be isolating. Um, 
the students are just off there. They don't know who you are. And this, this was the reason that for this class, I recorded the first lecture of the class. All of the lectures are just the works of art and my voice. But the first one is video of me. Uh, nobody really needs to look at me any more than they need to. But this humanizes the class. I used to get students who would say in the, uh, on, uh, at ASU, I would get emails, Dear Miss Mitman, and I thought, not, this should clarify the situation. Um, but, but I said, I would ask them, didn't you notice the voice on the recordings? And they said, oh, I figured that was just some actor, and you know, I didn't know that you were a guy. Okay. I don't care whether they know I'm a guy or not. Um, I have a last name which begins in A, which means... Uh, which ends in A, and so that means in this country I get all my mail to Miss Asa Mittman because nobody can fathom a name that ends in A and isn't female. Um, so, uh, uh, so I, don't, I mean, that doesn't bother me. What bothered me was that they clearly just had no idea that there even was really a professor. They had no idea who I was. They didn't think that there was a real person out there talking to them. Uh, and I think that this humanizes that a lot more. Now they know who I am. Um, th there's a face behind the voice. The other thing I'll say is, on that note, when I was recording the podcasts, in a way, it's completely distancing, right? I'm not in the room. It, you're, you're all alone listening to this recorded thing. On the other hand, I really think these can be, do I even dare say it, intimate? The thing is, in a classroom, you might have 20, 40, 50, 120 students, and it's me and all of them. Whereas here, it's just me and you. That's it. Um, and these students who have got just me on their headphones, in their ears, alone in their room, are going to have a very different experience. Essentially, these are one-to-one -one conversations, not one-to-many, even though many people are, could be listening to them simultaneously. So when I was recording them, I tried to bear this in mind and tried to modulate the ways that I was speaking in order to convey a more direct person-to-person -person, uh, communication. Whether I succeeded in that or not, I don't know, but I will say that that was at least uh, a concern. I think it's something people should bear in mind when they're trying to record these lectures. Okay. Oh, um, sure. Just to conclude here, one of the things I find is really interesting is that, um, and we'll go back to one of the conversations we had earlier, is I try to include at least one element in the designs I recommend with a, a thing that's familiar mm -hmm. to students, and in this case, it was the cell phone. And the cell phone was used for the photographs of the pieces of art that were out in the community, for the most part, because people would take it with their cell phone oh, and yeah. upload it because they take pictures all the time with cell phones. So is that one comfortable component? The other thing is you should know that if you have an iPhone, you really can just about use this entire thing on your iPhone. You can listen to the podcast. You can put it on Google Map, and as you can see, there's di find directions to the, the mm -hmm. pin, so to speak. And so you could be listening and following along on your map and literally doing a walking tour of Chica, which is known for its art. Well, that's precisely my hope is that this will, in a way, replicate. When you go to a museum, you get one of those guys. You used to always go to the Metropolitan, and it would always be Philippe de Montebello's voice whispering in your ear. It's a very patrician accent. Uh, but he would guide you through uh, the works of art. And so this is the students guiding people through the works of art. Absolutely. So it becomes almost like their personal tour guide mm -hmm. to the works of art here in Chico and afar, which surprised me, which I didn't expect to see, you know, people from people doing it in Hawaii or yeah. whatever. So I think that this was pretty successful, Asa. I was very pleased with it, man. Yeah. I'm really pleased too. So oh we have one question. I have one more now that came to me and that is um Asa, since you did this with um the students who aren't art majors, might you think of using an assignment like this in one of the major courses? It's a good question. I've thought about it a bit. One of the limiting factors is that the art that I teach is old and European. Uh, and so we just don't have any here. Um, we have a few little bits and pieces, but it would be very difficult to build an assignment around them. Now, if I, I ask at the beginning of every semester, if any student owns a jet, <laughs> we can do field trips. Uh, but it is something that uh, I think that... Um, we should think about because 
there are ways of integrating these kinds of ideas without actually having the students go and look at the works of art. There are other ways that they might participate in these kinds of activities. And so, yeah, this is something I've been giving some thought to, how to integrate this sort of thing into uh, my upper divisions. I haven't come up with the answer yet. But, but I think we can agree podcasting is a valid way for students to articulate the information that they've retained or Oh, yeah, I adapt. think it's great. I think it's, I think it's wonderful. Um, one of the things that is often lost in an online class is the uh, audio component, right? <laughs> uh, in class, we always ask our students to speak. And one of the most – I had a conversation with a student yesterday, and she came to my office, and she said, I know you want us to speak in class, and I haven't yet done it, but – that's because I, I don't like speaking in front of people. And I said, well, I, I understand that. But I have a lot of students who might say, I just don't like memorizing dates. Well, it doesn't matter. You still have to on the exam, right? Uh, so the fact that a student may or may not want to participate, this is one of the very active ways of engaging in course material. I think it's very important for students to uh, find a voice with which to express their thoughts about art. And so getting them not just to write, but to speak about it, I think is very valuable. Um, the one note that I will make is the ones that I've listened to, and I've listened to quite a few, <laughs> they're really enjoyable, is they do try to take on, meaning the students, that professional tone of the um, commentator. And yeah. I think a lot, of you, a lot of them do try to mimic your uh, presentation style, which that if they be. can do that, they definitely learn something good in their college <laughs> career. So I guess we'll end here, Asa, and I just okay. want to thank you very much for coming in today and recording a session with us on the podcasting experiment that you did in your uh, Art 100. So thanks again. Once again, this is the uh, Technology and Learning Program here at CSU Chico, and uh, we hope you come back and tune in for another one of our sessions. Okay.